So we are in this conversation that we are talking about making a difference, being salt and light. And um, when Bishop Gibson asked me to consider coming to speak uh, some time ago, I sometimes have a crisis of faith. I don't know how many people have a crisis of faith. You know, like, what's the topic? Making a difference. Huh? Okay, you should have chosen. You should have chosen someone. Uh, because many of you may not know, but I have a long history um, of being timid. Being, you know, just being under the covers. You know, the stage or in front of people was never something that I, I really was my thing, you know. It didn't have to be a stage. It just had to be a group of people. And they'll be speaking and speaking and speaking. And it get to my turn and my, somehow, I start sweating. You know, things begin to happen. And so I had written myself off. I thought, you know, I am not a headline. I'm more like a footnote somewhere. And uh, I was happy there. And it seems like the story of my life has been one of being pushed to the front, you know. People just constantly saying, no, it's you. It's you, it's you. And so I, I trust the risk will pay off. Uh, if it doesn't, uh, you will blame God. Uh, so I have nothing to do with it. So it's a joy to be here and to have this conversation about making a difference. And I loved where Pastor Dana uh, left us uh, last, last week, sharing the truths um, from First Kings chapter 18 about the life of Eli Elisha. Um, Elijah, rather, that number one, she shared that being salt and light means prioritizing our physical and mental health. That, you know, as we see this servant of God burning out and being reminded, you know, uh, we need to prioritize that. She also shared that it means being willing to be real with God and to say where we are at exactly. You know, a lot of times I feel like we relate with the world as an avatar. You know, there's this image that we carry out. But beneath that is, you know, all manner of struggles. And sometimes when we are honest and candid with God, he's able to tell us uh, what the next step is. And then she finalized and saying that it means a willingness to obey God and we need, when we sense his, his direction. And so today we want to continue with that uh, conversation by uncovering uh, just four key points of awareness, you know. In many ways, I felt like uh, you will come and witness me talking to myself because a lot of these points, I was like, oh, okay, that's something that I'm learning, even in my journey at, um, at Mombasa, um, Gateway ICC. And so the first thing I'd like us to do is just to examine, you know, the song that we sang here, you know, this is Holy, Holy Ground, Holy Ground. And as you think about how uh, Moses is invited into a holy ground. And our key reading comes from Exodus chapter 3, verse 10 to 12. <clears throat> um, the context of this is that, you know, um, Moses wants to make a difference. He sees the oppression uh, of his fellow countrymen, the, the, the Jews. And he wants to make a difference, but the way he wants to make that difference is not from a very informed place. So he uses force. And so God sends him off into the desert in Midian for the longest internship ever. You know, we are being announced for here that uh, Cultivate takes one year. Moses took an internship, lasted 40 years as an intern under Jethro's care. And towards the end of his internship, he comes to this mountain of God, Mount Horeb or Mount Sinai, and he sees a burning bush. And God tells him, you know, um, out of curiosity, he draws near, and he tells him, now, don't come any further. Remove your shoes for the place that you're standing is holy ground. And so we catch up with him in uh, Exodus chapter 3, verse 10. He says, God says to him, come, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, and this is something so familiar, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? He said, but I will be with you. And this shall be a sign to, for you that I have sent you when you have brought the people out of Egypt. You shall serve God in this mountain. 
But Moses has a crisis that's unfolding. And so in uh, chapter 4, verse 1 and 2, we see Moses responding and saying, But behold, they will not believe me or listen to my voice. I don't know whether you ever feel like your voice doesn't matter. You ever feel like, I, I don't want to raise my voice because it, it won't, want, won't matter. We see this crisis of faith unfolding in Moses' life. He says, they will not believe me or listen to my voice. For they will say, the Lord did not appear to you. Then the Lord said to him, what is in your hand? And he said, a staff. A staff. Again, we catch up with him in Exodus chapter 4, verse 10 and 12. A pile of excuses and stories that are unfolding. But Moses said to the Lord, Oh my Lord, I am not eloquent, either in the past or since you have spoken to your servant. But I am slow of speech and tongue. I wonder how long it took for him to get these words out. <laughs> but uh, it sounds pretty eloquent to me. Yeah. <laughs> Then verse 11, he says, Then the Lord said to him, Who has made the man's mouth? Who makes him mute or deaf, seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? So we see this crisis unfolding. Yeah? And I think the first point of awareness for us to examine, if we are going to be the people that will be the salt and light, the people that will make a difference in the marketplace, the people that will make a difference at home, in the, in the government, or whatever space that God has called you to be. I think we have to examine the ground on which we stand. On what ground is God inviting us? You know, the first invitation is for Moses to recognize the ground that he's standing on. And I think unless we begin to realize what ground we are standing on, then it would be particularly difficult for us to make the difference God is calling us to make. And I think this ground is just who God says we are. Who God says you are. Who God says I am. Because it's on that ground that I'm standing here today. It's, there's no other ground. Yeah? It's on that ground that you are here today. It's on that ground that you are serving where you're serving. And I think when we hear these words, as, as, as Jesus speaks to his disciples... And he tells them what? You are the salt and light. You are the salt and light. Sometimes we have to let that sink in. I don't know uh, if they were standing in a row and then they began to say, hey, what did he say? Uh, he said, you are the salt and light. Because sometimes we don't see ourselves in that identity. Because the, I, I guess the reason he's inviting us to see our true identity is because our we are prone to putting the light under the table. We are prone to withholding our tests. We are prone to not raising our voice. So he says to us, you are the salt. You know, the book of Second um, Peter, uh, chapter 1, verse 3. The title up there is Confirm Your Calling. Confirm Your Calling, which is reestablish the ground that you're standing on. It says what? His divine power has granted to us all things. And I'm told the meaning of, the Greek meaning of the word all, and Dr. Leo is here, can confirm, is what? Is all. <laughs> In other words, there's no mystery to it. It's just, it's all, yeah? That he has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. Not only has God given you an identity as salt and light, he has empowered you. He has given you everything that you need. Sometimes we feel like we lack, but God has given us and we have to believe that because it's on that ground that then we make a difference. Ephesians 2.10 reminds us, we are his workmanship. Some versions say we are God's handiwork. Created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Some versions say for us to walk in. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? 
that you have been prepared for such a time as this. And I like what Paul tells Timothy, because in many ways, I am a recovering Timothy. <laughs> I don't know how many people here can identify. He tells him what? To guard the deposit that was entrusted to him. For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. And self-control. I think that's the ground that we have to examine. And say, is that because standing in any other ground, you will not, you and I will not make the difference God has called us to do. So he has empowered us. So sometimes all we have to do is show up. Because the ground is already set. All God wanted Moses to do to show up. Follow the curiosity of the burning bush, which is the opportunity God is availing to you and I to make a difference. Show up. Half the job is just to show up. So, which leads us to the second key point of awareness. If we are going to be the difference makers that God is calling us to do, we have to come to a place of awareness that it's not about us. It's not about me. It's about the difference God wants to make in and through me. You see, as Moses is being handed this lofty assignment of freeing the children of Israel, he's thinking it's all about the identity he has is the fugitive. You know? But he has to come to a place of recognizing, you know what? It's not, it's not about me. It's about the great I am that comes with me. And what a privilege that God would consider you and I champions for his causes. So, so we tend to hide our salt and put our lamb under the table. Sometimes because we think it's all about us. Yeah? And so what do we do? We come up with a script of inadequacy. Yeah? We come up with a script. And we rehearse this script over and over and over again. And so Moses presents his script before God and he says, who am I? Who am I? I am not eloquent. Yeah? Isaiah says in Isaiah chapter 6 verse 5, Woe to me, I am a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips. A script of inadequacy. Benjamin, when God is calling him to go and rescue his people from the stronghold of the Midian, Midianites. He says what? In Judges chapter 6 verse 15 and 16. My clan is the weakest. It's almost like saying you can't find my home in Google Maps. You, you, you can't find it. How can you ask me? Of all those fancy places that you could find, you came to? It says my clan is the weakest, the whole in the tribe of Manasseh, and I am the least in my entire family. He presents that script. We present a script to God every time we are met with an opportunity to make a difference. We present this script because it rationalizes our inaction. Because if I have a compelling script of why I'm not making the difference there, then I'm off the hook. And so I have a narrative too, and Alex Ngui said, Lord, some people, when they stand before others to speak, they have butterflies in their stomach. Me, I have chicken. <laughs> and turkey. That are causing havoc. So you, surely you understand. Pick someone else to do it. But I have to convince myself, it's not about me. It's about what God wants to do in and through me. All I need to do is show up. And so I've showed up today. Amen? I pray, that, I pray that you show up. You show up. You don't have to have all your ducks in a, in a row. We trust that the ducks are outside, not in your stomach. Yeah? Yeah? But may you show up. And you also have a script. I wonder what your script is. Perhaps that script is playing in your mind right now. 
What is this script that you have? And what we need to do as we grow in this awareness is to take our script and to tear it up. Because we are, we are realizing it's, it's not about me. It's about the difference that God wants to make. You know, I remember Bishop Gibson standing here and saying, we are going to plant 100 churches. I'm looking at this guy, I'm like, <clears throat> okay. But it's not about Bishop Gibson. Bishop Gibson is simply showing up to the invitation God has impressed upon his heart. It is up to God to make it happen. You see, God, God is calling us to that awareness that it's not about us. Because in Psalms 23, verse 3 says, He leads me in parts of righteousness for his name's sake. It's his name on the line. It's not my name. It's not your name. So would you show up? You see, when we approach opportunities to make a difference with our inadequacy script, we miss out on the burning bushes around us. And there are all manner of burning bushes around us. Burning bushes just being the opportunity that God is presenting before you to make a difference. He tells you, draw closer. Sometimes that burning bush will be in a plane as you're traveling from one place to another. Sometimes that burning bush will be in the office. Sometimes that burning bush is in, on the kitchen table. An opportunity to lean in. And so when we know it's not about us, we show up and we let God to do the work. You see, the burning bush was not a one-time occurrence. There are burning bushes everywhere. And this leads us to the second point, the third point rather. You see, where does Moses witness this burning bush? It's in a remote place. Yeah? Unsearchable in, in Google Maps. Some place in a mountain in the bush. Because the Bible tells us he led his flock to, towards the mountain. Yeah? So far away that they can't even find him when they're bringing lunch to him. It's in that space that he has his encounter with God. And I think the third point for us is <clears throat> we have to come to an awareness that our context, where God has planted you, where God has planted me, is your gift from God to make a difference in his kingdom. Your context. Your context. You know, we, we seem to have a perspective about places. You know, we seem to prefer some places over others. You see, we seem to regard some places with more blessedness than others. And so we think that, oh, when I leave this company, then I'll really be making a difference. You know, when I go to Safaricom or whichever other company that you're really sending application to, you know. Woe unto you that you're not saying, when I leave this marriage, I'll make a difference somewhere else. <laughs> yeah? Because... We lack the awareness of God right here. Yeah? So sometimes, uh, for example, I, I, I read of a joke that somebody was telling. He found two men fighting in church. And he told them, you know, why are you fighting in church? You should not fight here. Which is almost, in a way, in a sense saying, it's okay to fight in the parking lot. <laughs> because here we sense God is here. But out there, we don't sense God is there. You know, I was uh, dropping a friend of mine in the airport today, and there was a big sign there saying, corruption free zone. Is corruption okay somewhere else where that sign is not there? <laughs> it's not. So we carry this mindset of God is in some places and God is not in other places. And so we miss the opportunity to make a difference. And so the awareness that God is calling us to is to reevaluate our theology of place. And let me tell you, I had my own withdrawal symptoms, leaving ICC Nairobi, going to Gateway Changamwe. Because, you know, I, love, I, I began describing that I love the warmth here. Yeah? So, so obviously you'll have, and I began to, I had my own crisis of faith, I'll be honest with you. Until God said to me, in fact, he reminded me, when we were first presented with the opportunity to go to Changamwe, God said to me, do not Google up that place. <laughs> you, you like going to Google Earth and zooming in 
and seeing how fancy the place is, you know. Don't do that. And it took me months. It took my wife and I months to discover why God was telling us that. And he told us, you know what? I am not calling you to a status quo. I am calling you for what I want, I dream of that place to be. And I'm simply asking you, would you show up and walk this journey with me? And so I had to get over my withdrawal symptoms and begin to engage. So we tend to want to be associated with some, some places. And we tend to lose the alertness to make a difference in the spaces that God has invited us. In the Bible, we see God working out his purposes in the most unexpected places, you would think, you know. You know, I imagine when the disciples in Matthew chapter 14, verse 13, when they, him and, the, and Jesus and his disciples retreat to a remote place and a whole crowd follows them, the disciples allow the remoteness of the place to attack their faith of what was possible there. And Jesus tells them, no, 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 don't send them away. You, you feed them. Because we don't see it happening there. Nathanael said what? Can anything good come from Nazareth? You know, let me tell you, I, I once lived, after college, I once lived in uh, Gidurai 44. And I began seeing news you know, insecurity in Gidurai. And I began to take it personally. Because I almost feel like people are saying, can anything good come from Gidurai? It's a beautiful place. You know, I'm learning that uh, the name Changamwe means a place of feeble soil. For those of us who have been to Mombasa City, maybe you witnessed on the bypass after SGR, there's a place where the road just kept in because the nature of the soil is, is feeble. Yeah? And I ask myself, why did I come to a place of feeble soil? Can anything good come from? But God told me, this is the ground I am choosing to grow my disciples. And all I want you is to show up. So can we reevaluate our theology of place? Jacob, when he's journeying from Beersheba, you know, He's walking through this ordinary place and it's, actually it says he came to a certain place. Yeah? He came to a, a certain place. We used to have a friend uh, whenever after work we would drop people uh, off to their homes. Eh? You know, doing campus ministry. And I had this friend of mine who the cab driver is constantly asking, okay, what is the name of your stage? Uh, don't worry. When we get there, I'll tell you. And then out of nowhere, he's a hapo, 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 hapo. You know? <laughs> Just a certain place. Yeah? It's a certain place. So I feel like in the description here jo uh, Jacob is giving, is, it's a certain place. And so he picks a stone and uses, uses it as a, as a pillow. Who does that? Yeah? And then as he snores, he has this dream of a gateway. A, a grand staircase. And God is standing on the top of it. And I like what he does what he says after he wakes up in Genesis 28, verse 16 and 17. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place. I pray that you wake up in your office and say, Surely the Lord is. I pray that you wake up in your kitchen table and say, Surely the Lord is in. In, in whatever space that you find yourself. What does he say? And I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. The gate of heaven. You know. And he went ahead to rename that place Bethel. You know, the previous name of that place was Luz. Luz was uh, L-U-Z. -L um, the, the, the meaning of Luz is just a place of almonds. Yeah. We, we have uh, uh, a skill in naming places in Kenya, don't we? Yeah? It's, so it's just named after what grows there. But now it has a new name, Bethel, which means house of, house of God. 
And I wonder what difference it would make if we carry this awareness to the marketplace, to our homes, to the streets, wherever you find yourself, you would begin to see Bethel's everywhere. So we are examining the ground upon which we are standing on. We are seeing um, how our context is a gift when we realize what God is doing in that space. But we may be saying, I'm now seeing my office, my time in traffic, my time at home as a Bethel, but how do I make the actual difference? Which brings us to the third point, key point. And this is what, this lies in the question that God asks Moses, what is in your hands? And I like to say that what is in your hands is a tool that God has given you to make a difference in his kingdom. You see, to Moses, it was just a stick that he used to, you know, shove around the sheep, the camel, uh, and whether, whatever the donkeys and whichever other domestic animals he had. Yeah? And the question is, what is in your hand? How ordinary is what is in your hands? You see, it's not just the places that we treat as ordinary. It's also the things that are in our hands. We tend to belittle what is in our hands. And we tend to concentrate on the deficit of what we don't have. Oh, if I had this amount of money, I'll be doing this. If I had this, if I had this job, I'll be doing this. Trust me, you will not, if you're not doing it now, chances are you will not do it later. And that's why the Bible tells us, be faithful. He who is faithful in there, the little things will also be faithful with much. And so, is the glass half full or half empty? Is it just two loaves and five fish or excess lunch for a multitude? Is it just a cloud the size of a feast, like the servant who the prophet sends to look out seven times? Is it just, or is it a storm that is brewing? Is it just a little oil in a jar or it's an endless trickle of supply? And I guess that's the question that we all have to ask ourselves. So Moses lets go of his stuff and God's command, on God's command and discovers what God could do with it. The widow of Zarephath surrenders her last meal with her child and never lacks. A little boy gives away his lunch, whatever is in his hands, and it feeds thousands. Unfortunately, the unfaithful servant in Matthew chapter 25, 14 and 30, withholds, withholds. So what is in your hands? Sometimes it's not even money. Sometimes it's time. Sometimes it's influence. Sometimes it's just the networks that God has blessed you with. It could be a list of endless things. And what we are discovering in Changamo, we, uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, we thank God that um, through Kenya Assemblies of God and ICC Nairobi um, in particular, we've been able to purchase that school. And we are running a school. Yeah, We've uh, just completed 31 million shillings. Now we are into the stage of um, just clearing the stamp duty and then the transfer. But what we are beginning to discover is what is in our hands. And for us, we have come to discover is the time we have with the children. The curious little minds that are coming to school every day. And they look forward. They look forward to Wednesday. Because that's when we do uh, the weekly PPI. And they look forward. And have come to treasure Wednesday mornings. My wife, who is the director of the school, is constantly hurrying us up. To go. Yeah? Let's go. Let's go. And you should see how they light up. And we thank God uh, through um, our connection with the missionary through ICC again. We were able to set up um, a computer lab where the kids, every afternoon, they have a lesson in computer. And they, you should see how they light up. And the joy for us is to treasure what is in our hands. Destinies. 
that are being shipped. So what is, what is in your hands? What is in your hands? So that leads us to the final point, and this is where I want to really land. You see, we could reevaluate the ground that we are standing on. We could see our context as a gift. We could see the value and the need to hand over what is in our hands. But I think the thing that makes the greatest difference is when we become who God says we are. My final point is that I, come, I have come to this realization that a David in Saul's tunic or Saul's armor will never make a difference. He will never make a difference that is separated from your encounter with God. He will never make a difference. We see the story of David and the stalemate, the battle stalemate that is there. The children of Israel are stuck. And there's this giant Philistine who is daring them to come. And the lunch boy, David, comes and says, hey, what's, what's happening? You know? And he's told, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, and he volunteers. Yeah? And I'm sure the people there were saying, okay, you want to volunteer? Okay, it's your funeral. Go ahead. And all these soldiers, you, you want to? And he volunteers for his funeral. And what does Saul do? In verse 17 of 1 Samuel, I mean verse 36, 38 rather, of 1 Samuel 17, it says, then Saul clothed David with his armor. Maybe it has a special anointing. It is the armor of the, the king. Yeah. Maybe Bishop Gibson is giving me his armor. Yeah. Because it has that anointing. And it says, he put a helmet of bronze on his head and clothed him with a coat of mail. And David strapped his sword over his armor and he tried in vain to go. I think those, those are very important words. He tried in vain to, to go. For he had not tested them. Then David said to Saul, I cannot go with this. For I have not tested them. But there is something that David had tested. And where had he tested this? It's out of his remote encounters in the bush with his God. Out of the limelight. The moments that he spent with God. So David put them off. Can you imagine what courage it took for him to do this? He says, no, 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 no. I will not make a difference like this. And he put them off. Then he took his staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones from the brook and put them in his shepherd's pouch. His sling was in his hand as he approached the Philistines. You see, we can try in vain to make a difference when our attempts are not drawn out of a lifestyle of working with God. We will try in vain to make a difference. And it just won't work. It may work for a while, but then you're stuck. You see, David's walk with God allows him to make a difference in an unconventional way. It is, not, it is our consistent, transformative walk with God which makes a difference in our lives first, then frees us to make the most difference outside. You know, what does Romans 12, verse 1 and 2 invite us to? Yeah? To be, do not be conformed to the patterns of this world, but be, be transformed. By doing what? By the renewal of your, why do we need to renew our minds so that we may be able to perceive God's perfect will. And when you do an examination of these two key words, conforming and transforming, conforming is about allowing the external force to change you. You go into a space, it's that workplace, it's that place that is written corruption free zone, but there's corruption. And so you conform to the shape of the culture that is there. 
It's more like being a thermometer. What does a thermometer do? It simply reads the temperature, but does nothing about, about the temperature. You know, it's like being a chameleon. What's the true color of a chameleon? It is whatever color that happens to. And I feel like a lot of times as Christians, we can be like chameleons. If we are conformed to the patterns, you know, we are conformed to the patterns. But the invitation that we are given is to be transformed. And what is being transformed? It is being changed from the inside out. So that the change is coming from within, a place of being changed, and it's spilling outward, countering the forces of conformity. It's more like being a thermostat. A thermostat does what? It doesn't just read the temperature, it controls the temperature. And that's why I think we have been invited to be salt. We are not just to shrink to whatever shape culture takes. We are to... And I think when we are transformed, then whatever environment that we are in takes the color of who we are on the inside and not the other way, not the other way around. I pray that as you show up in that office, it will begin to show the color. I pray that when I come here, I feel the color of Bishop Gibson and his pastoral team. I feel it. I pray that I will also be able to transfer it where? In Changamwe. I pray that in that office, you know, I, I, <clears throat> I read something somewhere. You know, sometimes job, we change jobs a lot, right? You know, you move on to another job. But while you are where you are, you know, I, I read somewhere that, you know, people can leave your leadership, but people can never leave your influence. That if you leave a lasting influence on people by the color you bring, then you are making a difference. So I'd like us just to call us to a place of reflection, a place of asking ourselves, you know, what ground am I standing on? You see, just like David allows his private encounters with God to transform his environment, God is inviting us to a deep walk with him that then allows us to paint the world in the color of who we are on the inside. You see, I find that it is Moses' stuff that makes the greatest difference. It is not Pharaoh's chariots that make the difference. They sink in the in the sea, but it is the, the tool, the authentic tool that God has given to you. And a shepherd, um, a, a, a staff is a symbol of God's leadership of our lives. When we submit to being led, Psalm 23 verse 4 says what? Your rod and your staff, they, they comfort me. So I'd like us just to bow down and to go before God and to really I don't know where you are. Maybe for you, you're standing on shaky ground. You've diluted your identity. And God says to you, you are the salt and light in that space. Maybe you just need to hear God tell you, yes, you are. And you respond and say, yes. Maybe for you, you just needed to learn that it's not about you. But it's about the difference that God is calling you to make. Would you make a commitment to show up? Maybe you've had a wrong theology of the place that God has planted you in. You're always thinking of exit, 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 but not opening your eyes to how that context is a gift. May you open your eyes. Maybe for you it's realizing what he has put in your hands. And instead of withholding, giving it out. And lastly, maybe you have been walking around in the wrong armor. Living off the faith of other people, but not having a direct experience with your God. 
that then allows you to be authentic in the space that God has planted you. And I think that journey begins when we give our lives to God. Maybe you're here and you're saying, that's, that's where I am. I want to give my life to him. I want my spaces to be painted with the color of who God is making me on the inside. Are you there? Would you just raise your hand if you're there? Or if you're watching us online, just indicate that. I'd like to give my life to Christ and we'll pray together with you. In the overflow, if you're there, just, just raise your hand and we'll pray together. Maybe it's just time to shed off that avatar, that thing that shows the sense of I have it all together. But then inside, it could be empty. And I believe if you're there, just, just pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I come to you. Strip me of anything that is not of you. Let me walk in my authentic experience of you. Save me, Lord. Make me your child. Make a difference in and through me. Lord, I just thank you for those that have prayed that prayer. Whether they're watching us online, whether they're here in our audience in the overflow, you see their hearts. I pray that, Lord, you may walk, begin to walk with them. A journey of transformation. I pray that, Lord, we would hear testimonies of the difference that they are making in the spaces that you call them to be. We honor you, Lord. And for the rest of us, Lord, in whatever area that, Lord, you're touching and stirring our hearts, examination of our ground, discovery of what is in our hands, the gift that our context is, Lord, I pray that we will walk out of here and shine your light on those places. We bless you and we honor you. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. 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 So, um, just before I leave, is I wish you this. May you tear up your inadequacy script. Let's go and write those things that you give as excuses and just tear it up. Don't throw it in the dustbin. You might go after it and garnish it. Just burn it up. May you unwrap the gift that your context is. Amen. May you be awakened to the tools God has placed in your hands. And may your intimate work be the source of your difference. Amen.